Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol David. I'm the Executive Director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation, and I want to welcome you all to our Grow Native webinar this week. Uh, our topic today is Missouri Adapt a Highway Program with Native Plants, and we have two speakers this afternoon, Mar Mark Oftenberg and Mervyn Wallace. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and, and we have a wonderful presentation for you today, and we have an exciting lineup of webinars and master classes scheduled through March on a variety of topics related to prairie and native plants. And we hope you will join us for more this winter. And we're also planning more programming for the spring as well. I'd like to thank our speakers today, and I'd like to um, also thank our Grow Native program sponsors for 2021. You can see their logos or their names here on the screen. And uh, it is thanks to their support and uh, through our professional members and other supporters that help us put on this programming and do so much uh, of the other things we do with our Grow Native program. I'd also like to thank Brooke, Brooke Widmar on our staff who did so much to help uh, preparing for the program today. She's not able to, to be here today, but thank her very much. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A section or the chat. And when Mark and Mervyn are done presenting, I will ask them your questions. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow along with any resources that are mentioned in today's session. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. Mark Oftenberg is the Senior Roadside Management Specialist with the Missouri Department of Transportation. Prior to accepting this position in spring of 2020, Mark served as the Roadside Manager for MoDOT Southeast District for 20 years. And prior to his MoDOT career, Mark worked for 10 years as manager of an agricultural retail location after graduating from Southeast Missouri State University. Uh, our second speaker is Mervyn Wallace, owner of Missouri Wildflowers Nursery. He's been in the business of propagating and selling plants of Missouri genetic origin for more than 30 years. And through the years, Mervyn has also grown into this well-qualified role of educator. His uh, Missouri Wildflowers catalog has become a handbook for beginning and longtime native plant gardeners. He's earned the respect of his naturalist peers and has given us access to some very fine plants and the knowledge to grow them as well. And Mervyn has also adopted a section of highway himself and has planted it with natives. So he'll be sharing his perspective uh, in that regard as well. So without further ado, take it away, Mark. All right, well, thank you, Carol. Uh, again, my name is Mark Offenberg. I'm with MoDOT uh, as a roadside management specialist. Um, I want to welcome everybody today and uh, thank you for attending. Um, today we want to talk about a little bit about, about Missouri's Adopt-A-Highway program and how it might fit for you. Um, we have several different options available. You know, most of the time we think of Adopt-A-Highway as just litter pickup, uh, but there's also other options available for adoption. Uh, as the Grow Native that we just, uh, Carol just mentioned. And so uh, we're gonna get started. I will apologize, this is the first time I've ever had to do one of these. And so uh, if I get a little tongue tied, you know why. Uh, as far as Missouri goes, we have over 385,000 acres of right of way in Missouri on our state highways. Um, that translates to over 33,000 miles of roadway, um, of which there's about, let's see, 1,380 miles of that is actually interstate, which would have the widest right of way. Of course, litter is the big thing of, for Adopt a Highway. Uh, we probably spend $6 million annually just for the litter, litter pickup, litter control, uh, disposal cost. Within MoDOT, uh, that's is our MoDOT crews. Uh, we, incar we use incarcerated crews from the in different institutions around the state, and also our adopt highway volunteers. Um, we have not been able to use the incarcerated crews for most of this year, of course, with the COVID. Uh, they have not been available to us, and so that has been a big loss for us at this point. As far as adopt a highway statistics. Um, we have over 5,400 groups currently, which have adopted over 6,500 miles, most of which are for litter control. Uh, it's probably 95% for litter pickup, but they're also, uh, we do have some other adoptions available. Uh, 
Missouri started its adopt a highway program way back in 1987, shortly after Texas was actually the first one to have the first adoption in the country. Uh, in that time, there's been more than 8,000 groups, individuals, organizations that's been involved with our adopt a highway program. It's grown mostly if you've been driving on any Missouri State Highway, you've probably seen the blue adoption signs out there. Uh, you know, that's mostly the advertisement is when people drive down the roadway and they see the signs that are out there for current adopters. Of course, Adopt a Highway is just not a Missouri uh, program. It's actually an international program with over 48 US states, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Puerto Rico, Canada, Mexico, and I'm sure there's other countries out there that also have it that I'm not aware of. And also your local city, county may have adopt a street or adopt a road program. Uh, this sign is actually was one I, I'd taken a picture of because it caught my interest is actually a, in a local city for adopt a street. And you can see they kind of copied their signs. Uh, there may not be quite as large as our uh, MoDOT Adopt the Highway signs, but uh, they are very similar to our MoDOT Adopt the Highway signs. But I know traveling around, I've seen uh, like the city of Columbia in Missouri has uh, Adopt a Spot program, I think they call it. And a lot of cities and counties actually have an adopt a adoption program. Some of the benefits of Adopt the Highway, uh, provides anti-litter education, sense of ownership, uh, builds support in the community, uh, actively involves the public, uh, improves roadside appearance. And we, we estimated it's probably a $2 million value to us just to, you know, just what the adopters pick up for us every year. Because without them, you know, our folks just would not have the time to be out there and pick up all that litter that's, that, uh, that their, our adopters do for us. Okay, for our, our options for adopt a highway. Of course, litter pickup, that is the biggest one. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, our biggest adoption. Um, probably 95% of our adoptions are by for litter control. Another option would be beautification or mowing, I'm sorry, mowing. You'll see a lot of this around the cities, say St. Louis, Kansas City, uh, interchanges outside of those outside of those areas where uh, maybe the local city has adopted that area and are keeping it is keeping it maintained and and a lot of times looks you know like a golf course. But that is mostly just around the cities and towns. It's usually not in the rural areas. Of course, beautification would be another one, and like the interchanges with those cities as they've adopted that and they've beautified that with landscaping. A lot of times businesses uh, will adopt a, a section of roadway right in front of their business because you know that our state right of way, even when it goes through some of these cities and towns, our state right of way uh, is in front of these businesses. So they'll adopt, adopt that location in front of their businesses to beautify that area. Here's actually another beautification project. This is just one that was on a, on a where the, the intersection of a roadway where there's a little, the little triangles uh, that somebody has adopted. It could have been a business, could have been an individual. Most of the time it's like a business or community group that adopts these areas and uh, wants to keep it looking nice coming into their cities. Another big area these days for adoption on these would be roundabouts. All of us are probably familiar with roundabouts in the recent years. They've become very popular. Well, the, the center section of those is very popular for adopt, adoption also for beautification. And of course, to grow native area. That is one that we have available to folks. We don't have a lot of, uh, had a lot of takers on that. I know Mervin said he's, he's actually adopted an area for, for a grow native for us. But that is another option out there for grow native. We, we do want you to plant Missouri native plants in those areas, or it could be for adopting an area that already has, you know, a lot of native plants in those areas and you just want to go out and maintain and enhance what's already there. 
Okay, with any of these adoptions, uh, MoDOT's gonna supply you with adopt highway signs. Uh, you've probably already seen these signs somewhere on our roadway. We're gonna supply you with the you know, safety materials, safety vests, uh, some caution flags to use while you're out there. We definitely want everybody to be safe that's out there anytime on our MoDOT right away. Uh, safety brochures, uh, we're gonna supply you with the safety video, a safety for safety training purposes. Uh, again, we want everybody to be safe. Of course, we're gonna supply you with the litter bags, the yellow litter, litter uh, trash bags. And whenever you fill those trash bags up, you just place them out beside the roadway and then our crews, MoDOT crews will come back by and pick those up. Here's just a photo of some folks that uh, had done a litter pickup. And uh, of course we'd like everybody to take a photo and, and send it to us when they can uh, to show us, show us their group. How to adopt, uh, you go to MoDOT's website, www.modot.org, or you can call 1-88-ASK-MoDOT-275-6636, uh, and that'll put you in touch with uh, the local adopt a highway representative for the area that you're in, or you can contact me, contact me yourself. Now we'll go in and, uh, okay, adopt for a clean, adopt today for a clean tomorrow. <laughs> We'll talk a little bit more about some of the other uh, seeding activities we do here at MoDOT. This is actually a, uh, an area that was seeded previously and then we had come back several years later and had to reseed this area because of erosion purposes. Uh, we needed to reseed it to try to get some vegetation on it. And so our first 30 foot off the roadway, off the shoulder is usually what we call our clear zone. So we do usually try not to seed it in too many natives. It's mostly the area that we're gonna keep maintained and gonna mow on a regular basis. But anything beyond that is actually seeded in a native, a native grass, a native, native plant mix on our right of way. So anything beyond the first 30 feet would be planted in a native, a native plant mix. Here's just another area that was seeded. Uh, as you can see, we know we're trying to get just, some of these areas are very challenging, you know, across the state, you know, some of the, some of the soil types after they've gone through and done construction is very challenging to try to get growth on. So uh, we have found over the years that uh, actually the warm season native grasses seem to perform the best for us in these areas because it's just, it's just not enough fertility there to maintain anything, anything but that. Here's another area, you know, this is one that was actually overseeded uh, with some natives. Uh, you don't, can't see the grass so much, but there's a lot of native grass in that area along with the wildflowers and a few, a few, a few thistles in there also. Of course, pollinator habitat. I'm sure everybody's heard a lot about pollinator habitat. Uh, over the last several years and in the, in the decline in the monarch uh, population. Uh, of course, here in Missouri, we have I-35, which is called the, you know, commonly called the monarch highway. Uh, and we are actually doing some planning on the, on I-35 currently, uh, hopefully it'll be completed uh, later this spring uh, for some pollinator habitat uh, and also I uh, got on here about that we have a research project currently going on with the University of Missouri uh, that should be completed later this summer also that they're doing some research on us about pollinator habitat on the right of way. Uh, where should we plant pollinator habitat, where there should not, where we should not plant pollinator habitat, uh, whether it should be in the median of the interstates, not be in the medians, what should be the width of the medium if we're going to plant pollinator habitat in that area. And some of the different plants. What's what's some you know what's a good planting mix for uh, Missouri for pollinator habitat? Here you'll see uh, this is actually just uh, where our rest area welcome center is up on I-35, just south of the Iowa border. Uh, there was that was all planted about ten years ago in a native native plant mix, and we're actually going in now with this 
pollinator habitat and, and doing some enhancements to that and planting some more pollinator friendly plants in those areas and also trying to main in, in to uh, control some of the invasives that may have come in there. Here's another location up there we're doing. It's at the old rest area site, actually a truck parking site now. And uh, those areas are gonna be converted to pollinator habitat. Uh, and there's some other spots on I-35 that's being done also that I didn't show. Let's move on to a little bit about some invasive species control. Of course, we know we can do the, the native plantings, uh, but it, we, we've got to control the invasives along with that. We can't just go out there and plant natives and expect them to thrive without controlling the invasives that may come in that. Here's a location, of course, you can see the prairie rehab sign, but see all those tall plants that's coming in there are probably uh, mostly pear trees which we all have seen across Missouri, how, how they've invaded the state in the last you know, five to 10 years. And so we're trying to go control those mostly by spot treatment. Uh, we're using a lot of ATVs, UTV type vehicles these days to go out and try to spot treat these areas without going out and doing a broadcast type treatment. Because we want to save the natives that's there. We don't want to, you know, we want to just control the invasives. Here's another photo of some Bradford pear trees that uh, have taken off. And I'm sure everybody that's been through Missouri in the springtime when these were blooming, you, you, they're just, those right of ways becoming solid with them in some of the locations. Um, I know St. Louis, Columbia, uh, there's a lot, a lot of pear trees coming in on the right of way. Uh, spotted knapweeds, another one we're trying to control. It's really prevalent down in the southwest part of the state of Missouri on the right of way. Here's just a photo of what I actually took myself of how, how it can just actually take out everything else that's out there. It, it, it becomes the, the dominant plant in those areas. Teasel's another one. Uh, I think it's found everywhere in the state these days. Uh, of course, this is just a photo of it in about uh, middle of May when it's just starting to really uh, bolt up, which is an excellent time to control it. It's easy, easy to see, easy to go out and spot spray those areas. And of course, Charissa Lespediza, we can all see how thick it gets and actually takes over uh, everything in those areas and chokes out everything else. And so that is just a few of the, of the different species we're trying to trying to do it what we can to control on the right away that we have to keep continually keep fighting and here's just a well it's a little blurry but it's, here's what we you know of course would like some of our right away to look like uh, with some native plants wildflowers of course that's just a little brief real brief uh, summary of what's going on on some of our plantings on the right of way but uh, we would love to have uh, any of you come adopt uh, some of our right of way and help us maintain maintain some of this area or if you'd like to adopt some of our right of way for uh, adopt a highway your group your organization wants to do that actually a lot of our adoptions these days are in memory of a loved one so that is uh, something another option if you have a loved one if you'd like to do an adoption in, in uh, we can do it in memory of someone. So that is just a real brief summary uh, of what uh, we have going on with Adopt a Highway currently. And uh, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Mervyn. Thank you so much, Mark. And Mervyn, as you're just, uh, as uh, Mark unshares his screen and Mervyn shares his, um, Mark, I'd like to ask you a question. We've got tons of questions here. Okay. Um, I thought I'd just ask you one while while Mervin is uh, getting his uh, set up, and then we'll ask the rest later. Um, uh, Matt is asking: Is there a length of time commitment for the Adopt a Highway program, and have there been, you know, have have there been any issues of people signing up and then not following through? How do you deal with that? And um, again, is there a, a time commitment if you're going to adapt a highway? 
Yeah, it's normally, it is normally a three-year uh, agreement that we have you sign for that. Of course, uh, I, I say it's three years, but at the same time, if, if for some reason you need to get out of that or somebody needs to exit that before the three years is up, you know, we understand that. But after the three years, we're going to send you a renewal in the mail and ask you if you want to renew that commitment to do that for another three years. Okay, thank you so much. You're Mark, very welcome. Do you, and do you have your, okay, so Mervyn's going to pull his presentation up. So uh, thanks for all the questions that have come in. I do see them and I will answer them as I can, or uh, I will just wait and ask them of uh, Mark and Mervyn when Mervyn is done. Take it away, Mervyn. We're there. You, you've got my full screen now. Correct. Okay. Um, and I'm hitting the arrows. I uh, want to show you some motivati motivational pictures, I, I hope, of some roadside plantings that I've done in the Jefferson City area, mainly south on Highway 54, and then point out some basics <clears throat> that can make a wildflower planting successful. Uh, so about uh, four or five years ago, I took this picture and it's a, I went across the road and it's uh, an area where Heritage Highway joins Highway 54. It's just uh, east of the Morrow River. And a lot of people see this every year and it's been here since, well, about 31 years, since around 89 or 90. Uh, and you can see my little pointer, can't you? That's good. Um, so part of this was done as it was done as part of a research contract that I had to come up with some ways of establishing wildflowers on roadsides during that period. And um, the ones that I did as part of the contract, I planted in rectangles. So can you see this arrow? I'm not getting a response from anybody oh, there. I'm sorry, I uh, I don't think I saw it. Uh, or try yeah, it again. I, I oh yeah, see it, Mervin. yeah, we see it. All right, good. Uh, so that's a rectangle. Uh, was a rectangle of yellow coneflower I planted. This was glade coneflower. I did a mix over here, and then this is yellow coneflower up here. We're going to look at close-ups of these in a minute. Um, that was all done by just me throwing out my seed trash from cleaning seeds. And then this is the same thing from here, clear down to here was uh, purple beard tongue from trash that was thrown out. And then all along here at, oh, about four or five years ago, they, it was just a straight drop down almost. And MoDOT went through and, and made it a more gentle slope. And when I saw they were doing that, I went and collected the seeds from the area up above and then went through in the fall and seeded over that area. And so this is several years later and it's been very successful. So we're gonna take some close up look here. That's that yellow coneflower on the south end or the left side of the picture. Um, when I first did this, I was throwing out seed trash. The plants were much farther apart and within a couple of years, uh, the first one started to bloom. And the very next year, I could see seedlings coming up. So the seeds from these plants were, the first ones were falling on the ground and, and germinating. And it's really thickened up a lot. Um, this is how it looked a few days ago. And you can see all these gray stems sticking up there. We cut the seed heads off during the summer, but uh, that's what it's, we don't mow this and fortunately mowers can't get up there and mow it. So if you're selecting a site, I want to talk about that in just a minute. Uh, one, one other species that has moved into this after I did the seeding is Missouri Black-Eyed Susan. The Missouri Black-Eyed Susan was always there on this site. So my feeling is that there was a glade in that area at the time uh, when the road was built through. So this is a little bit farther back. Uh, and at the left side of that original picture we looked at uh, in the corner. So 
if you're trying to pick a place to plant, places like this are the most successful. And there's lots of them in the Ozarks. There's, they're in Kansas City, St. Louis area. Uh, there's some in the Columbia area. Anywhere that you get uh, rock near the surface and they do a cut through the rock to build the highway, often they um, feather that depth of that soil out from the edge back maybe 10 or 15 or 20 feet. And that shallow soil area at the top is a great place to seed. Even if you just put the seeds up here on the top, it's not long till they begin to seed over the cliff and you get them on the, on the bluffs. I've seen them come up uh, the first, even the first time they start blooming from me just going along the top and throwing the seed out. Seeds don't all stay in place. So a good, oh, notice there's cedar trees coming up in here. Well, cedars like to grow in those places. It's really dry. You might be looking for a place that's got the rock cut, but all you see is cedars on top. Well, if you could get uh, if you could adopt it, get the cedars cut out, you would have a seed bed ready to, to uh, plant the seeds on in December, January period. Uh, this is what most of that area looked like when I did the seeding. There was a little bit more vegetation probably, but I picked a spot just to take this picture and show you that um, there's a lot of little pebbles on the surface. And this is a really successful place to seed into. Over here, there's a little more dirt that's been freezing and thawing recently, and it's really loose. And when you put seed on a place like that, it falls down in between the rocks and into that loose dirt. Uh, you get a rain come along and it even gets settled in better. And then in the spring, the seeds germinate. So the time to do the planting is December or early January. I need to get all these points of when to do the planting or how to do the planting, which I may have to go back over when we get done here. So if you go back and look at that little red dot there, uh, that's where about where I stood and took this next picture here. That picture was in June. And I know that because that's when these flowers bloom. But there was a, a really good overlap that year when I got it. I don't know how many years ago I took it, but it's not been very many. This is the area where a seed mix was planted, where all this open uh, it's not as dense it is as it is back there in the back. Uh, there are several species here that aren't blooming. One is landsleaf coreopsis right in there. There's like one plant. And when I first did the planting, I put a lot of landsleaf coreopsis in it. Uh, and it showed for about eight years. I've thought I always say it'll, it'll be gone in about eight years. And that's usually the case. Um, so it's just yellow as it could be the first year, first two or three years with the Coreopsis for about three weeks. And then it eventually uh, gave way to the rest of the species as they grew and developed and got bigger and crowded it out. Um, in the back here, I've got three of those blocks and I'm gonna show a picture from the back end down here. That's next, looking the other direction. This is some uh, red bud, and there were more red bud to my right where I took the picture. Um, so this is that rectangle in here of glade coneflower. That's a rectangle of yellow coneflower. And by the time I took the picture, many years later, from the plant beginning planting, the purple beard tongue was just about gone. So if I backed up just a few feet, and took another picture. This is what you would see. The, this was, there was red bud there and I eventually cut it. Um, what was happening here, I think, is the birds were going out eating, <laughs> eating seeds of uh, the yellow and glade coneflowers and came up here and dropped some. And you can see what was happening in that planting with the crossing of the species. It's more pronounced here than it is actually in the in the planting because the space got occupied and and seedlings aren't as successful when it's already occupied. But this area under the trees that was bare and 
they were able to get a hold. So there's a lot of different variation in those. It's, it's pretty neat. Uh, plant beater, breeders could get really rich on a plant like that, build a wing on the house. Uh, looking the other direction from where that picture was, at just 180 degrees farther along the highway, this is purple beard tongue. It's native to Southwest Missouri in a few counties. Uh, Taney County is one of them, south of Branson. Actually, it's at, or south of Springfield. It's also at Springfield on a glade at the Nature Center. Um, this is another picture of it at another location, Highway D. It's really done well in the Jeff City area where I put it. Um, but it has to be up there on the side of the road, uh, not out in the median, because it gets it, it needs to make it clear until uh, August, September period before its seeds are mature enough to reproduce. And in the median, it often gets mowed before that happens. So when I have put it in the median, and it's there, but the plants are getting old. So back to the uh, heritage highway planning, the first one we looked at, uh, or what we've been looking at mostly. The question is, how long will these plants stay here? And, and one more thing I need to point out, these little fuzzy plants, because somebody's going to ask, this is bottle brush blazing star, another glade species from southwest Missouri, where the uh, purple beard tongue grows. But how long will these plants stay here if you plant them? This is really a, the most successful planting that you can do if you're looking for a place to adopt is these rocky places. Um, because you have very little maintenance. You have to cut the cedars um, if they come up. And there's pockets of good soil in there. So like the red bud was growing in a pocket of good soil. Um, I, I think that they could be there for thousands of years myself. And when you think about it, you've got a real glade and this is a real glade. I mean, you've created a real glade on a highway when you cut through those. This is a real glade in Taney County. And these plants have been here. I, sh I would wish I'd have done the research to know for sure, but I'm gonna say they've some of them have been here since the uh, last ice age. I'm sure there's people that, that know. Um, and, and there are many more species than what I showed you that I've planted that can grow in these kinds of places. You just need very shallow soil uh, with some solid rock exposed. Um, and I had some reason I was going to say that. Well, I'm gonna go on, <laughs> sorry, forgot what I was gonna say on that one. So what we're doing is transitioning from that glade site into a deep soil site. If you're doing a planting on deep soil, this, this is that kind of a result you could get. Um, but before you plant, there's probably gonna be fescue. And if you're adopting a site along a roadside and you're creating a plan to do that and working with the people at MoDOT, you're going to have to come up with a way to get rid of the fescue before you, before you plant on that site. And then after you get it planted, um, you're going to see quicker results probably in terms of something flowering uh, and more, more species flowering, but it's going to take, uh, it's going to take longer three to five years on the glades for them to really start to, to do well. Uh, but if you abandon this or you uh, turn your back on it, you're gonna have a lot of different species invading it, of the exotics that were already mentioned, the invasive species, and you're gonna get more tree species because you've got more water and better soil here. Uh, this is the lance leaf coreopsis that I was talking about. It's growing in deep soil here and it would stay much, a, a much shorter period of time here uh, than it would on that uh, place at Heritage Highway that we talked about the most. Um, 
And this slide is a good example of what can happen with the frequency of mowing. It's, uh, you, can, you can interpret what's going on anytime you're driving down the highway in the summer. You can, you can see that where they mow the most, it's usually fescue. And then where they mow once a year, it's wildflowers and grasses, native grasses. Uh, fescue is growing in that area also. Um, what happened here is the lance leaf coreopsis, which is this. This is a dry site, uh, drier than the rest of it. And, and here's a little dry pocket. And over here is a dry pocket, a dry area. The mowers have, especially in the median, have picked up, because I planted seeds in the median, but I didn't plant them here. When they ran the mowers through in, I'll say, late May, early June, the seeds got on the back of the, of the coreopsis got on the back of the brush hogs and traveled down the highway falling off, but they only germinated where there was uh, soil poor enough to keep fescue from growing. I guess, I guess that's one way of saying it, or it was shallow enough that fescue didn't grow there. Uh, and I think this is a shallow soil spot here. Now, the other thing is what happens when you don't mow at all? Well, you get trees. So this is sort of an example of, of all of it in one spot. Uh, this is a place, a couple of places in Barton County where they didn't get mowed. Well, you can see the, the to the bottom of the ditch, it got mowed at least once. This is gravel road. Uh, these are the last flowers in the fall to bloom in this site. And these were blooming in September, September 1st when I took the picture. That means that if these didn't get mowed between then and the end of September, then the peak monarch migration got to benefit from these. Uh, the peak is around the middle of September, I think, or September 20th, something like that in Missouri. Uh, same thing here. These, this is sawtooth sunflower. I think both of those pictures are. Um, at any rate, uh, and yeah, one more thing about this picture, and I'll go to the next one. They mowed this probably once on each side, for uh, which they do for sight distance and safety. Um, so, whoops, that didn't work. I've got. What I was going to say there is covered up. I'm going to read it. On, it. on any day during the growing season, one can say there is more monarch and pollinator habitat today than there will be any time during the rest of the season. Now, uh, what that means is from the beginning of the spring until beyond the monarch time when the monarchs migrate and the last, you know, the last plants are, uh, well, all during the growing season, plants are getting mowed down. And yeah, that happens in hay fields, but along roadsides and in idle ground on, on private property, uh, you can really pr promote a lot of uh, habitat for monarchs and pollinators without planting anything if the species are already there. You just have to do the mowing once a year during the, I call it brown season versus the green season, during the dormant season versus the growing season. And that's my last slide. So I could go back to that one right there or we Great. could- Thank you, Mervyn. Um, that was great. Actually, can you keep your presentation up there, Mervyn? Uh, well, no, that's well, that's in, in case people have some questions. Uh, sure. And Mark, if you um, could unmute yourself, or and uh, uh, we have tons of questions, and I um, I don't we'll we'll just I'll just keep asking the questions until you guys have to go. And uh, everyone who, who uh, posed questions, thank you so much. I'll do my best to get through them all. I may have to kind of paraphrase and combine some of them because there are so many, and which are which is great. Um, 
so uh, uh, kind of a some questions about mowing and maybe Mark, you could speak first from MoDOT's perspective and then um, Mervin, but there are a number of questions. One, um, why does MoDOT have to mow 30 feet? Um, and, and Mervin did say, um, uh, you know, for sight distance, but, uh, you know, is it always 30 feet or is it, you know, 10 feet? And then another question which um, Mervyn alluded to is, you know, well, people are asking, well, why does motor have to mow? And as Mervyn said, if we don't mow, then trees will grow up. Um, but then it seems like it's an issue of mowing timing, you know, um, not mowing until the natives have flowered and set seed, but then you also, you know, need to take into consideration the invasive. So, so Mark, first, could you just answer about why 30 feet? And is it always 30 feet for mowing? Well, actually, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, through the growing season, it's supposed to only be one pass, which would be maybe 15 feet for the most part is all we should be mowing. Uh, 30 feet is only in the fall of the year that we would mow 30 feet. And that's just for the clear zone. We always, usually 30 feet is what's considered a clear zone. And so that's an area we have to keep, keep, you know, keep open without any uh, large vegetation. Thank you. And there was another question. Some, some people have seen really large areas, entire slopes mode or the entire median mode. Um, is that, uh, I mean, it seems like sometimes medians might be more than 30 feet. So can you talk about, is that supposed to regularly happen or, um, you know, no matter what the vegetation is, whether it's native or non-native, can you talk about, you know, people are wondering about when they're seeing that kind of mowing. Yeah, I mean, like I said, not, even on the median, unless it's less than 60 feet wide, it should be uh, only mowed just the one pass. Anything over 60, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, can be uh, maybe mowed. Uh, we only want, really want that mowed though in the fall of the year, uh, not not through the growing season. Uh, trying to minimize the mowing as much as we can through the growing season. Uh, I, I, but I do agree with Mervin. I'd rather see it mowed during the you know the brown season if it's going to be mowed uh, to control control the trees. And and thank you. And and just one other thing, people were were asking if they adopt a spot and they you know plant it with natives. Um, how do they ensure that it won't be mowed until the, the quote, until the fall? How do they ensure that it won't be? Because some people have, have their questions, they've been concerned because they have seen areas that were adopted in natives and then it was, it was mowed in the summer. So how do, how do people, um, you know, when they go through the adoption program, how do they communicate that to, um, you know, how do they communicate that? Well, we'd have to work with our local maintenance building there uh, within MoDOT. You know, we have uh, hundreds of maintenance buildings within MoDOT, and so we have to work with the local maintenance uh, supervisor to make sure we get the message to the mower operators to, to not mow that area and to stay out of that area. Like I said, the, they should only be mowing one pass or 15 foot through the growing season anyway. So, You mean not the whole area, just that, just that band, just that 15 feet or... Uh, along the edge is that what you mean yes yeah thank you and and um mervin did you have any comments about kind of timing of mowing <laughs> that you'd like to make well you were talking about the median and the and the, the uh i used to well the <clears throat> I used to have a shed out here at brazito um uh, highway modot shed and uh, i ended up buying that property when they sold it <laughs> but the guys that worked there were, they knew all of my spots out here and they would avoid mowing them whenever they could and it didn't follow in the fall in the uh, criteria of the regulations. But at, at any rate, <laughs> now that they're not doing it, uh, sometimes my spots get mowed, but I know that they're not gonna die unless they mow them three or four times a year. Thanks, Mervin. And um, Jack has a question. Um, why doesn't MODAT seed all right-of-ways and natives and save those, you know, bigger mowing costs? Is that something that MODAT can do, Mark? Yeah, we, do, we, we do use a native mix uh, on the right-of-way. Anything, anything beyond the 30 feet is, is seeded in a native mix these days. Mm -hmm. uh, so anything that's not, you know, mowed on a regular basis, we do try to do that with. 
So that would be like new air, like new highways, mm -hmm. if there's new construction. Is that what you sure, mean? Sure, the new construction areas are definitely done that way. Now, as far as, you know, uh, converting existing acres to natives, you know, that's a, that's a very expensive uh, undertaking to, to, yes. to go out and try to do very many acres of that. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, several questions on does MoDOT provide the seed if someone wants to adopt or a, a, a provide the funding for the seed? Um, no, we don't do that, um, and, but you might be able to work with, work with your local, you know, conservation people, and uh, they may be able to find you some seed. I know in the past I've uh, got some seed from them at no cost, so. Okay, thank you, Mark, and it, um, in terms of, uh, and then uh, also some questions about is there a recommended mix? Um, and Mervin, of course, has shown some, some photos of, of uh, natives that he has sown, and uh, Mark showed some photos as well. Does MoDOT have a list of native plants that it recommends, or is it really up to the adopter? Well, it would really be up to the adopter for the most part in those areas. Um, you know, of course, we want to make sure they're, they are using Missouri natives. Great, thank you. And um, uh, just want to make sure everybody's aware that the Missouri Prairie Foundation's Grow Native program has um, a native plant database of more than 300 species and you and it's searchable. So say you wanted um, plants that um, grow at a certain height, you uh, or maybe, well, maybe not height, but um, colors of plants, plants that do well um, on drier sites or water sites, and you can select and create your own list that way. Um, and then in terms of purchasing seed, um, you can purchase from our Grow Native professional members who sell seed, and you can look at our Grow Native uh, resource guide at the Grow Native website. Um, another question uh, from Stephanie, is there a charge to adopt a highway? Mark? No, there's no, uh, there's actually no cost to the, to the adopter whatsoever as far as adopting a highway, whether it be for for uh, seeding or for even for litter pickup. I mean, of course, on the litter side, the only the only cost to you is your time and labor you put into whatever project you're doing. And, and of course, if they and, and purchasing seed. Yes, and in that case, it yeah. would be yes. Okay, thanks. A couple questions: um, Can uh, highway adapters plant native shrubs and trees, or does it need to be herbaceous? You know, wildflowers and grasses. Uh, probably mostly uh, wildflowers and grasses. Uh, I mean, we, there might be an option of doing that, depending on the location, I guess, would be a, a good answer uh, as to whether or not we'd allow that or not. Okay, thank you. And yeah, you did know, you did show that one kind of triangular area in an urban area that was planted with, looked like non-native shrubs, so people could probably do that with native mm -hmm. shrubs, but again, like you say, depends on the location. Sure, anytime it's in the, you know, the site distance area, like there at that triangle I showed earlier, you know, we have to keep that all as low growing vegetation. Mm -hmm. um, so usually it's below, you know, like 18 inches in height, uh, but otherwise outside of that 30 feet clear zone, we can plant some things that would get larger. Okay, thank you. And then in terms of, oh, Marvin, did you, sorry, Marvin, did you have a- Can I ask a Quick question, I guess, from Mark. If uh, are there any places in the state where someone has adopted the an interchange or part of an interchange? I keep looking at clover leaves and star or diamond interchanges and thinking, boy, all that space in there where they mow it several times during the summer could really be nice and wildflowers. To the point that I would even um, not really adopted for native planning is concerned. I mean, we do have some that, you know, I do know that we're, that we had over the years had actually uh, uh, seeded ourselves uh, that we, you know, we have that was not really adopted by anybody. Uh, but most of the adopted areas are actually like close to the larger cities where they actually want to keep it, you know, manicured and, and looking perfect, you know, for as looking like a golf course. Uh, but uh, I do know some interchanges where, you know, MoDOT ourselves actually maintain, maintain it in that native, native grass or native area. Thank you. Uh, uh, Judy asked, and I think you answered this, but uh, Judy asked, how, do they, how does MoDOT determine timing for mowing? Uh, it sounds like that, that can you, could you just repeat what you said before, Mark, about timing? How do you decide timing of mowing? Well, most of our mowing, actually, we, we mostly mow on uh, three, three mowing cycles a year. Um, one in like the middle of May, 
one's about the middle of July and the other one's in the, usually starts about the middle of September. So that's usually our three, three mowing times of the year. Now, well, I mean, we we're mowing through all throughout the summer because you're not going to get across every route in just a, you know, a, a week or two time. So it does take, till we get done with one cycle, it's usually about time to start the next one. And again, that mowing is, is supposed to be limited to the 15 feet or the 30 feet, correct? Yeah, usually, you know, through the season, we'd like to have, you know, just one pass, uh, 15 foot at the most. Now, there is some areas where you might have a sight distance, you know, corner or something that you do have to mow out wider just for sight distance. Okay, thank you. Um, Patricia asks, do, do you, Mark, does MoDOT have any areas that you would like to see in native plants that are available to adopt near the Kansas City area? Um, well, I don't know of a location right offhand that, that it's close to Kansas City, um, but we'd be willing to, you know, look at anything uh, if anybody wants to, you know, if somebody's interested in adopting an area for that, they just need to submit, you know, contact us and uh, we'll be glad to work with them and uh, see what we can do. Thanks, Mark. And a um, couple questions on is it, is it, can adopters burn at the exit and entrance ramps to clear woody invasives. So I guess if they, you know, are adopting an area, can they do burning themselves? Well, I wish we could burn on the right of way, but that's one thing that, you know, we cannot do. Uh, we have done a few controlled burns over the years, um, but for the most part, no, because, you know, the smoke coming across the roadway would create a hazard. Uh, so for the most part, we, we're not allowed to, we don't do any burning on the right of way. Um, and there's a similar question um, from Jana. While traveling through Oklahoma, I saw the highway right of way was being burned. Um, would this be an option? So uh, it, it is done in other states. And so somehow they've gotten around the, the smoke issue. Do you know why, you know, how, how that's allowable in other states? Are you aware, Mark? No, well, I don't, yeah, I don't know what, how the other states do it. Maybe it's a wide, you know, wide uh, median made, I mean, wide right of way. Uh, you know, it depends on the area. So we have done a few controlled burns. I know in the on MoDOT right away over the years uh, in a few locations. Uh, but you know, of course, the everything has to be just perfect for that to work out to do that with the with the wind and you know away from the roadway. Okay, thank you. Um, Cheryl or Cheryl says I've been trying to pick up the right of way on both sides for my frontage. I also I think she means pick up litter. I also spot spray invasives. Part of my right of way is along my six acre remnant prairie. Is that okay, even though I haven't adopted this spot? Oh, sure. We have a lot of people go out and, uh, you know, pick up, especially next to their property, uh, you know, litter. Um, and, that, and that is fine. And if they want, but if they want, would like, uh, you know, I guess credit for it, if you will. Uh, I mean, we'd be glad to do an adoption for them so that way they can have some signs out there to, to you know, let people know that they are taking doing that. So. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Nadia asks um, if, uh, what is MoDOT open to protecting native plant remnants if someone helps to identify those? Like there are some areas in Southeast Missouri with spider milkweed and common milkweed along Highway 63 between Columbia and Jefferson City. So, um, I guess what Natty is asking is even if we, even if somebody doesn't adopt a spot or adopt a section of highway, if they know of some special plant populations, can they bring that to MoDOT's attention if MoDOT isn't already aware and can MoDOT, you know, manage those, especially for those special plant communities? Uh, yeah, I mean, we'd be, I'd love to know where some of those different locations were, and then uh, we would uh, work with our local maintenance folks there to be sure to, you know, manage that. And we're not mowing it at the wrong time of the year, for sure, and hopefully it's an area that we don't have to mow at all, so. Okay. Uh, great, thank you. Um, Karen asks, where can the general public purchase uh, erosion netting, like what you showed, Mark, in one of your early slides? Uh, well, that was actually not erosion netting. That was actually uh, where it was uh, uh, hydro seeded, and mm -hmm. actually that mulch was uh, in in with with the hydro seed. You know that was put on with that. It, it, but do you do you know when people where people could buy erosion netting if they needed to? Or um, that... No, not I can't think of anything right off the top of my head. But you can I'm sure you can find something probably local to you. 
uh, if you if you search it, you know, and uh, see what you can find. Okay. Um, a couple questions about, um, you know, if we're, if we're planting natives right along the highway and that's, that's, you know, attracting a lot of insects, are we gonna, are we really hurting insects because of course there's gonna be some mortality with uh, passing vehicles? I would just like to address that if I may. Um, so the answer is yes, but um, yes, there, there, is, there is insect mortality, however, in my work with Monarch Joint Venture, the Xerces Society, other professionals, the consensus seems to be, and this is based on, on research, is that while, while there can be an increase in insect mortality, there's still a net increase in insect populations because they have more native plant food sources. So, um, the consensus is we, it's, still, it's still important and, and better to have uh, just get as much, you know, habitat uh, roadsides into native vegetation. It will ultimately increase, you know, we'll have a net increase in, um, in, uh, in, in support for insects. Uh, another question about preparing soil for seeding and Mervyn explained this, he talked about how um, planting on those real gravelly areas where there's not a competition from other plants is really important. He also talked about the deep soil areas and how um, if there is existing fescue there or other non-native vegetation, it will have to be removed. Um, so I would like to see if, if either of you would like to comment more on that, but I, I have another question, which I think other people have too. Um, say you do adopt an area, you plant natives, can you talk some more about the maintenance? Because it isn't just going out there and, and prepping the soil and seeding, but it's checking on invasives. So would the adopter be responsible for treating the invasive plants or is that something that MoDOT can do? So that kind of goes along with, you know, if you've got deep soil, you're gonna have more plant competition and there's gonna be invasives and then, you know, how much, what's the role of the adopter in that invasive plant control? So, well, I, from MoDOT standpoint, I, I mean, I would like them to, to control them if that's the area they adopted, yes. Okay, you'd like the adapter to control. Mervyn, did you want to comment any more about soil preparation? Um, well, you need, on those deep, on those deep soil sites, if you had killed fescue, uh, one of the most important things to do to make it successful, you're going to seed it during the winter, uh, December, January. But at the end of October, beginning of November, you need to look at your site and see if winter annuals have come up after you kill the fescue. Uh, winter annuals will germinate in the fall with some good rain and continually grow all winter. And then in the spring, they bolt or they, they flower. And at that point, they may be several inches tall and completely covering the ground. And the wildflower seeds just don't recognize that they have a place to germinate and grow. So they just sit there. OK. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Ariel has a question, again, about mowing. Um, why? Uh, why mow in the fall rather than the early spring? And I guess the answer to that would be there's just, it's not very high yet in early spring. Is that correct or? Yeah, the growth is just not there. And then of course, you know, we're coming out of, out of, out of wintertime as, as MoDOT, uh, you know, wintertime is, is our, you know, a big, a big time for us like now through the winter months is, is of course, you know, uh, snow and ice control. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we're, we're trying to gear up then and get, go from one season to the next. And so we just really don't have as much time in the springtime to be out there mowing. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I got, um, I got a question I'd like to ask Mervyn if I could. Yeah, you bet. Uh, when you're talking about the, these glade areas and, and seeding those, like, the, like your photo here, um, what, 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 is, what would be the best time of the year to overseed those with the wildflowers? If you've already got something growing there? you're saying, I guess? Or just a new seeding completely. Well, December is my first, first choice, but because it doesn't always happen in December, I usually 
they will up till the middle of, these, of uh, January. And then if people are buying seed from us, we'll, we'll push it a little farther than that. But some of the seeds need, especially some of the glade species need a really long cold period, cold moist, not just cold. You can't just stick them in the refrigerator and go out and plant them in the spring and break that dormancy. You gotta get them in the ground and let them be cold and moist. Uh, some of them need three months. Uh, that the Missouri black-eyed Susan is one of them in particular, which is a native species on glades. So uh, more of a more of a early spring seeding would be best. No, no, uh, winter. Winter, December winter, in January. Okay. If you are going to plant native grasses, they're going, they're most successful planted in, in spring, but then you got to get them covered some way. And when you put the seeds on in the winter, uh, the seeds get covered by freezing and thawing and those processes. But that's not going to happen if you seed after uh, the freeze thaw cycle. Okay, thank there? you. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, we still have some more questions. If you guys, it's 501, but we still have 181 people with us. So if you can keep going, but just let me know if you guys do have to, um, to go. Um, uh, uh, Nadia is also asking, oh wait, we already answered that one, sorry. Um, um, let's see. Um, oh, Mark has a very interesting question. How about planting something like native Virginia creeper vine to climb up and cover up like a lot of gray sound walls that you see along in an urban areas? Is this allowed? I think that's a really good question. Interesting idea. Mark, is that allowed? Um, yeah, I think we could probably do something. And my, I've, I drive through some of those areas myself and I see some of the uh, overgrown the uh, things that's happening around those sound walls. So uh, yeah, I, I think that, you know, that, that might be a possibility. And those sound walls are MoDOT property. Is that correct? I mean, if it is a MoDOT highway. Is yes, it... that is on the right of way. It's on the uh, back edge of the right of way usually. Okay, thank you. Um, a similar question, um, Leslie asks, where does the MoDOT right of way begins? Is it from the center line of the road? 30 feet out each way? Or can you explain that, Mark? Where does the MoDOT right of way begin? Like well, the right of way is the whole area, the whole area that the roadway is on and in the in the you know the, the adjacent to property next to it. So, you know, a lot of times you can tell by the utility poles, maybe, uh, where the right of way is. You know, like this picture that Mervyn has up here, chances are the right of way line is back there where that the right of way goes back to where that utility pole is. Okay. But is it measured, sorry, what's from the center line of the road or from the edge of the road? Uh, not necessarily either one. It can vary. The right of way can vary on a route. Okay. It's, not, right. it's not necessarily, you know, 50 feet or 100 feet, you know, straight straight off the center of the roadway or anything. It, it, can, it can go in and out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think you mentioned this, but could you mention again, Kathy's asking, could a group adopt an interchange area? Yes, yes. And of course, as you were mentioning earlier, Mark, when people um, do sign up to adopt, they're going to be prepped on safety because that is, of course, a great concern if people are, you know, where they can pull off safely to work on their, their uh, area. Is that correct? They'll, they'll, be, they'll be given a lot of safety information. Is that correct, Mark? Yeah, we actually have a, a safety video that we send out to all of our adopters. We want them to watch it and then we want them to make sure that they, they uh, brief and, and talk to all their group about the, the safety hazards to be looking out for when they're out there. Great. Um, Ted asks, is it okay to seed natives into disturbed right-of-way areas or suitable sites uh, along right-of-way areas on their own? Do they need, do they need to have permission? So I guess, I guess he's asking if they don't want to officially adopt but they just want to go out there and see, can they, can, do they have permission or do they need to ask first? Well, we would, we would like you to contact us and let us know. We usually don't like people doing things out on the right of way without uh, being aware of them. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Um, can you talk more about MoDOT's invasive plant uh, strategy and approach? Um, in the St. Louis area in particular, there are very significant areas that have been taken over by calorie pear and honeysuckle. Um, and there are sub, sub, a couple other folks had questions, especially about, you know, what's MoDAP doing to reduce or eliminate calorie pear tree invasions. Can, so can you talk about that in the St. Louis area in particular and maybe statewide overall? Well, it's just like any other invasive, you know, we'd like to try to control them on the right of way, but they have actually exploded so much in the last, in the recent years that, uh, um, it, we're having a hard time even trying to control them at all. Uh, and some of them have gotten so big that it's, you know, past, you know, any type of application to them. It's actually down to having to clear that area out, clear that area to, to, to remove them. So, uh, it, it's a, a very big problem and I don't know, I, mean, I really don't have a really good answer for you. And, and, and I guess another question I had is, um, uh, you know, I suppose if, if, an, if people, you know, if people were concerned about any MoDOT practice or more questions, they can, MoDOT has a very active um, uh, uh, comment feature on your website. Is that correct? Like if people are seeing things mowed and they think, well, that looks like more than 30 feet or if they're concerned about some, you know, invasive areas, um, what's the best way for people to communicate their, their concerns or suggestions? Do they go through that main telephone number on the main MoDAT site or, or what should people do? Well, they could either go to the website and I think there's a place there where you can enter, you know, a concern or you can just call that uh, MoDOT uh, 188-ASK-MoDOT-275-6636 uh, number and uh, you'll be connected with the, the local uh, customer service for that area and you can express your concern to them. Thanks and we'll, we'll put those numbers in the email that we send out to everybody tomorrow. Um, Anita has a good question. What's the minimum amount that can be adopted? And does size go by feet or by acre? Well, it kind of depends on the location and the type of adoption you're doing. If it's for litter control, we like to have at least a, a you know, mile or I mean a mile in each direction. So it's two miles total because if it's on a you know, two lane road, we'd like to put a on both sides of the road. So we put you a sign up going both directions. So we'd like to have at least a mile to do that. Uh, if it's a beautification, you know, location, it could just be, you know, a spot, just like we showed earlier on some of those triangles and things. It might just be, you know, that specific location and that's all. Uh, now, as far as the native seating, I guess it could be, you know, we could, uh, uh, it could be open, I believe. I don't, I don't know that, you know, there would really be a minimum spot or a maximum, either one, so. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, Byron asks, what if the highway right-of-way lies within, within utility poles, or if there are utility poles within the right-of-way? Power companies and uh, co-ops use herbicides to clear vegetation from interfering with the power lines and poles. So if people were concerned about, you know, they plant natives and then herbicides are put on uh, because of the you know power lines, how do people would they contact the co-op or the electric? How would people do that? Well, usually the the power lines are at the edge of or the back edge of the right of way, and so um, you know hopefully uh, we wouldn't have anything that was planted right underneath the power lines necessarily that close. Uh, usually the power lines are worried about the the taller vegetation getting up to the to their you know transmission lines is what they're trying to treat and control. So. Um, but yeah, that could be a problem. Thank you. Um, some other questions about um, some people are concerned if they see natives that that are diminishing because of um, MoDAT invasive plant control. And I know this is a very difficult problem. And and you know I know that MoDAT does you know try really hard to be very targeted in their use of herbicide. Um, it's a, it's tricky because. If MoDAT doesn't use herbicide to control some of these things like um, teasel and sericea, then it'll explode even more. And it is difficult when you've got a lot of miles to cover and you know to, to not have any overspray to harm the desirable vegetation. But Mark, could you talk about MoDAT's approach there? And you know, concern about, you know, desirable plants getting sprayed by accident? Well, it is a concern and, and, and you're going to have some, you know, mortality from, uh, from doing that, from treating the invasive sometimes. 
Uh, you know, we're trying to do more spot treatment on those. We're using the ATVs, the UTV type vehicles to do spot treatment. Uh, a lot of that area that we're, you know, is going to be beyond what our sprayer trucks could reach anyway. Uh, you know, anything beyond 30 feet is pretty hard to reach from the, from the roadway with a sprayer truck. And so most of that is done by, you know, either a tractor type sprayer or a UTV type sprayer. And so we are trying to just target, target the invasives themselves and, and try not to hit the, the natives. Thank you. Um, Kathy asks, is there any way that MODOT could help with an initial watering for new plantings? And you know, do you want to maybe address that, Mark, and also uh, Mervin, your experience of, you know, if you're seeding, how, how critical is the watering? No. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I don't think we'd be able to do that, um, honestly. Uh, you know, our folks are, are very busy trying to maintain the roadway and stuff throughout the year. And so, um, you know, the initial watering, you know, we would, we would have to work with the adopter to try to, uh, to work it out where they can get that completed, so. Okay, great, thank you. Um, question, so we talked about, you know, Mervin was saying if you're working in an area with deep soil and there's fescue or other, other non-native vegetation, you have, to, you have to kill that first. And Mervin, um, I, I'm assuming you mean to use herbicide to kill that out. Is that, uh, and then somebody asked, I mean, are we allowed to spray herbicide on right of ways in order to, you know, prep an area? So first, Mark, are people allowed to do that? Yeah, well, I mean, we can, uh, we'll allow you to do that, but we would ask you to come up with a plan, you know, submit to us for your, you know, for your area you're wanting to convert, uh, you know, and how you're going to go about that so we can work with you on that. Okay, thank you. And, and Mervin, could you elaborate a bit more on, on the site prep of, um, you know, killing out that fescue or other non-native vegetation? Well, yeah, you're going to, a lot of people want to cover up an area and kill it. And yeah, that's possible to do on a small area. But if you're doing something on the highway that's very large, it's, you're just going to end up having to spray it. Um, and there's, yeah, there's various things to use. Um, but the timing is important if you're, and I'm assuming you're, trying to kill a cool, a cool season grass plus any exotics that might be there. And since I said exotics, I wouldn't even consider trying to convert an area that had a lot of Cerisa lespedes in, in it because the seed are gonna stay there in the ground. The same is true for crown vetch. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, you gotta pick a spot based on what vegetation is there and fescue is the easy one to get rid of. And, but I, you would still want to use a broadleaf, I'm sorry, a, a full spectrum herbicide, not just a grass herbicide or a broadleaf. You want to use something that would kill everything. Thank you, Mervin. Um, Elizabeth mentions are about, you know, if volunteers are encouraged to plant only natives, could MODA include grow native information uh, for adopted highway? And I, I think that is a great idea. And I'm going to talk to Mark about this offline of um, you know, perhaps we can create some fact sheets with uh, uh, answers to a lot of the questions that have been shared today um, and uh, to, you know, uh, help, help, help people with, uh, you know, future questions they might have. So um, that's a great idea. Jan has some helpful advice. He says many of the utility co-ops have their own adoption programs and some even off offer cost share to people especially the landowner where the easement occurs to convert in native plants that are compatible with utility line maintenance. So if any of you um, are in that situation, you might contact your local electric co-op. Um, I'm gonna need to, uh, I think I'm afraid we're gonna have to uh, uh, finish up here, but uh, one other question, um, Mark, uh, there's a question here. Would MoDOT allow volunteers to go and work on these big areas with, with calorie payer? Um, so I guess in other words, is it possible to adopt a highway for invasive control? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, you probably wouldn't even have to adopt it you, as long as you contacted us and we'd be glad to work with anybody that wanted to go out and uh, try to help us control some of those on the right of way because they are a very large problem. 
But again, if they want to get credit for it, they can officially adopt it. Is that correct? Sure, sure. We can we can we can go through that process also, and uh, have, you know, to clear that area, and then maybe be able to seed it in some native. And is it possible to explain on the adopt a highway sign what's being done? Like I know you would, you have the word you know who who's adopted it, but it, could it say something like? to plant with natives or to control invasives because that might inspire other people. Is that possible? Yeah, we can put maybe some, you know, little freight. We're limited on the wording we can put on the sign. Yeah. Um, but you, we might be able to do some, you know, short phrases like that. Okay. Um, well, with that, uh, I hope that we answered most everybody's questions. I apologize if we didn't, but I think we, we were able to cover most of them and really, really appreciate um, uh, Mark and Mervyn, this was great information and so appreciative of everyone's interest. And just think what we can do uh, if we can get more folks to adopt and uh, have more road sites like uh, those beautiful photos that we saw in today's presentation. So look for an email tomorrow. We'll have a recording of this presentation along with some of the resources that were mentioned. If you have further questions, you can, you can email us back. And uh, with that, um, everyone have a um, great evening and thanks again, Mark and Mervin. Thanks. Thank you.